Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Mark's. We are so excited that you have come to worship God with us this morning. You received a worship program when you came in. It has all kind of information in it. I want to highlight just a couple for you now. Tomorrow night, our women's love group is meeting in the back in the hospitality area. We will have just a light dinner and we're going to pray with um, one another, and then we're going to work on our first quarter mission project, which we're making blankets, um, and uh, we'll tell you more about that a little later, but all women are invited to come and join us of any age. We just have a great time hanging out, praying for one another, and uh, working on a mission project, so that's tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, and um, we're really excited. The end of this month on January 28th, we're going to have, and if you have any questions, um, you can see Haley. Uh, we're going to have a community block party in Venue 701, and we're going to have inflatables, we're going to have games, we're going to have food, we're going to have music. It's just going to be a lot of fun. So that's Saturday, January 28th from 1 to 3, so make plans to bring all your friends to come, and we're just going to have a great time. If you have any questions, again, see Haley. I think John has an announcement. Yes, good morning. Um, just wanted to talk about an opportunity um, that kind of hit spontaneously um, as I was talking with staff and getting to know them and recently had a coffee with Robin and Jason. I can't believe we hadn't done it in a long time and it just kind of de developed our relationship to another level to get the chance to spend time together and understand each other's faith story a little bit and so I kind of it kind of inspired me an idea of how can we create opportunities for us to get to know each other as a group as a body of, of Christ in this church and so uh, I thought about this idea of called the power of three, and it's simply an idea of two or three people, maybe four, getting together for coffee, getting to know each other. So you, you have somebody who knows you at the church, right? So not just come here on a Sunday service, but understand your story and can be part of your support network. Because coming here as a body of faith, it's about worship, but it's also about supporting each other and knowing each other at a deeper level. So um, we're going to have a kickoff for this next Sunday. I've got a flyer at the back of the church if you're interested. Um, we're going to have that kickoff next Sunday after church. We'll form some small groups of two to four, you know, uh, no magic formula there. But just an opportunity to sh meet together, learn more about each other, so you've got somebody who's got your back as a member of this body. That's good. So I hope you can join us. Thank you, John. It's exciting. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us stand and worship God on this wonderful January morning. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things.
slave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name did I Oh God You have done great
our kids head up with Miss Haley to Kingdom Zone, let us all turn and offer the grace and peace and love of Christ to one another. which we believe, using this affirmation from the book of Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship. <laughs> Day by day, day by day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray. Before we pray this morning, friends, uh, many of you who are into the sports world, you know that um, the events that took place with this young man, Damar Hamlin, 
Uh, it brought out the spirit of prayer and faith, uh, unlike I've seen in, in years. Uh, you saw sportscasters on TV stopping and praying for God to move and to bring healing to this young man. And so uh, what was a uh, terrible event seems to be heading in a great direction. But friends, it just reminds us that when, when our backs are up against the wall, uh, we, we pray and we turn to God. And the beauty is, friends, you don't have to be in a terrible situation to pray. We are people of prayer. And so let's unite our hearts together now and go to the Lord. God, we do give you thanks uh, that, that faith is alive and well. And sometimes that faith uh, isn't revealed or manifest until there is uh, an inflection point, a point of desperate need where where we in our humanness finally realize that we don't have all the answers. We don't have the power and ability to do all things. We, we are blessed with science and technology to be able to do many great things. But there are points in all of our lives when really there is no other recourse. But God, we turn to you. And I, and I pray you'll forgive us for waiting until we're in a desperate situation, Lord, to turn to you in prayer. For you've invited us to pray. You've invited us to, to sit at your feet and, and just to fellowship, to, to listen to your wisdom, to pour our heart out to you, God. So we want to take advantage of that opportunity. We just sang, you are great, God. How great is our God. And I pray as we gather in this place today, I'm, I'm mindful that that we just bring all kind of needs, all kind of situations that we're dealing with. And so we just remind ourselves, God, of your greatness, of the greatness of your love, of the great extent that you have gone to to demonstrate your love for us. And so may we all, as we're gathered in this place, may we experience you, God, however we need to today. For some, it's, it's healing. For some, God, they need an answer to make a decision. Some need provision in a certain area of their life. Some of us just need your grace and your mercy and your fellowship to experience you in new and fresh ways to keep our faith alive. So Lord, however we need you today, I pray that we might experience you and we might leave this place renewed, refreshed, filled with hope, filled with faith, filled with confidence and courage, knowing that you are with us, knowing that in Christ we can do all things as you strengthen us, knowing that with you, God, all things are possible for those who believe. We believe today, God. We believe. Help our unbelief. Father, we would unite our hearts in prayer and pray in the spirit that Jesus taught his disciples as we say, Our Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven. hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Church family, we have had some milestones within our church family in December that, that I think you're going to want to uh, celebrate. One is Bob and Pat Raydell. They celebrated 50 years of marital bliss. Isn't that wonderful? Yay. And, and not to one-up you guys, but I know uh, my folks celebrated 59 years, is that right, in December? So for all the rest of you young people, if you need some marriage advice, now you know who to go to, all right? Y'all hang in there, I think you're going to make it. Friends, uh, there are many ways that we're able to uh, share our faith. Another celebration happened Christmas Eve as we presented this challenge of faith, just to be quite honest. It really was a challenge. Could we together as a people raise $3,000 
to invest uh, with many others into the Isaiah 117 house. You'll remember that is a home that's being built at the Chamless Center so that when a child is taken into protective custody, they have a warm and welcoming home-like place to wait until they are placed into a, a foster family. Well, I want to celebrate with you that we met that goal and we're able also to finish the year strong for St. Mark. So friends, that's, that's a thing to give uh, God praise for. Amen? Amen. This is not just a one-time project, and I want to let, let you know, this Thursday, January the 12th, from 3.30 to 5.30, you're able to go to the construction site if you want to see the brick and mortar, and they're going to have uh, Sharpies there, and you can write a scripture or a prayer or an encouraging note in the walls on the studs, and that's going to be you know, built into the structure of that home. And so if you want to see, friends, a dream becoming reality. You can be there and be a part of that. We'd love to have you celebrate that. One last uh, announcement. Uh, in addition to what John has talked to you about, about the power of three, uh, we are in this new year uh, being very intentional about creating opportunities for us to connect and to grow beyond worship. As you know, friends, what we do here on Sunday is so important, but it's not the total experience for us as the body of Christ, is it? And so we are trying to create opportunities for us to connect and to grow. One thing that I want to offer is a study that's been extremely meaningful to me in my Christian formation. It's called Disciple. So at the end of the month, I'm going to be leading a Wednesday evening study. We're going to journey through the Old Testament. I've got a handout that I'll be happy to, to share with you to tell you more, but I just wanted to plant that seed. If you're interested in going deeper in your knowledge of the faith, growing in community. Let's talk about that after church today. Finally, friends, let me thank you for how you invest your finances into the ministry of St. Mark's. You know, churches, uh, unfortunately, don't just run on faith, do they? It takes finances, and I thank you for investing in what God is doing here. You see on the screen ways that you can participate. If you're with us uh, on our live stream, we are so glad that you connect with us in that way. You can be supportive of that ministry and all that takes place here by partnering with us. If you want to do it the old-fashioned way, of course, you know we have the little collection boxes in the back. But friends, thank you so much for what you do here. Let's continue now in a spirit of worship. People, you're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope for the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. No one like our God For greater things have yet to come Greater things are still to be done in this city For greater things have yet to come Greater things are still to be done in this city God of this city, you're the king of this people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in the darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are. done in this city. 
to come. Greater things are still to be done. Sometimes it's not enough to be reminded that Jesus hasn't left you or forgotten you. We need to declare it over ourselves, over others. No matter the season you may find yourself in, no matter the depths of darkness you're wading through, you can join him in declaring the truth that God is light upon your feet, whether or not you can see the next step, that God is your strength even though the weight of life seems to be crushing you down, and that when your job, your marriage, your relationship, your health feels like it's coming to a dead end, there is only one God that can make dead things live again. These are His promises and they're the only thing you need to declare over your life. So as you step into this next season or this next moment, you can declare that God's not done with you. He's just getting started. You can declare that the good work that He has started in you, He will surely complete it. You can declare that the same God that parted the seas goes before you, goes behind you. You can declare these promises over your life, over your family's life, over the people passing on the street. You can declare these truths over every circumstance, over every season of your life. You can declare that every day belongs to Him and every new breath belongs to Him. Because we have the power of a living God living inside of us. And this is our declaration. Mm, amen. Yes, ma'am, huh? Tell you what, I hope that gets you fired up, church. I hope it does. This is a new year, and we want to begin this new year in faith. And I like the way that she talked about these great and powerful promises of God. You know, we just spent the entire season of Advent talking about the promise of Christmas. And I don't want you to just forget about that, to check out just because we flipped the calendar over to January. Amen? Are you declaring the promises of God over your life? So here's the good news. If you feel somehow you're still kind of stuck in a rut, you know, if you're a little bit discouraged, maybe uh, you're already falling behind on some of your New Year's resolutions. I mean, we're just, what, eight days in to the new year, but maybe you're already getting a little frustrated. Well, don't throw in the towel just yet because... We're going to hit reset here in the month of January. We're going to reset things. We're going to reset our vision, our values, the purpose that God has for us, the pathway that we take to get there. Our goal is to have a fresh start for the new year. I hope that the writer of Ecclesiastes got it wrong. Now, I know that's, you're not supposed to hear a preacher say there's something wrong in the Scripture. 
But I think maybe God allowed us to get a peek into his heart when he had the futility of life. He said, what has been will be again. What's been done will be done again. Why, there's nothing new under the sun. Is that, is that really the way it is, friends? That's the way we feel sometimes, right? I mean, it's just the same old, same old. But then contrast that to what the Spirit of God spoke through the prophet Isaiah when God said, I'm going to do a brand new thing. See, I've already begun it. Don't you see it? That's the question, friends. Do you see what God is wanting to do in you and through you? Can you see it? I want to pause there. I want to illustrate that with a story. You see, there was a mass of people. They were camped right at the edge of this narrow river, right where there was a river crossing. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of men, women, children, their cattle, their sheep, all of their possessions. They're camped. They're poised. They're just waiting. They're ready to take their next step in what has turned into a decades-long journey. In fact, the generation of people that are camped there, you know, they grew up sitting around the campfire hearing uh, the old-timers talk about the miracles that God did back in the day. Miracles of powerful deliverance from oppression and slavery. Then they, hold, they heard them talk about their hopes, their dreams for the future. And that future included having a land that they could call home, a land of their very own. In fact, it was the land that lay just on the other side of that river where they were camped. Now, there was a king that ruled that land on the other side, and he saw, of course, these tribes massing together. He had received reports from the field that, that this group had defeated other kings along the way, and now here they are, right in his own backyard. He decided to call upon the services of a very famous oracle, a seer, a prophet. His name was Balaam. You see, the king was hoping that Balaam would call down a curse on these invaders, that they'd be destroyed and his people would be safe and the land protected. So the king sent a delegation to this seer, asking for his assistance in his dilemma. Balaam considered the proposal, but he went to God in prayer, seeking wisdom. And he got this answer. This story, by the way, is recorded for us in Numbers chapter 22. God says, don't do it, Balaam. You're not to curse them because I've already blessed them. So the delegation returns to the king with the bad news. They said, Balaam's not going to do it. But the king is undeterred. He says, every man has a price. So let's up the ante. So he sends a more prominent envoy back to Balaam with this second offer. They came to Balaam with this message, King Balak pleads with you, come. He promises you great honors and any payment you ask. Just name your price, Balaam. He's willing to pay it. Just come and curse these people. Balaam replied, well, even if the king was to give me an entire palace, filled with gold and silver. He said, I can only say what God tells me to say. Once again, Balaam sought the counsel of the Lord, and this time he got a little bit different answer. It's recorded that God said, you can go with these men, but be sure that you only say what I tell you to. Now, what the king failed to realize was that centuries ago, God had already made a promise to the patriarch of this people. It was a pledge to give them the land that lie just beyond that river. The land, in fact, that this Moabite king was trying to defend. These people, they had been animated. They had been motivated. They'd been inspired by a vision. A vision that was given to them generations ago. 
In fact, generations had come and gone and passed, and many of them wondered, are we ever going to see it? You know, we hear about it. We hear the stories about it. Are we ever going to get there? Have you ever felt like that, friends? You're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting for the promise. But now this generation, the one that was camped by that river, they would be the ones that get to see it. They finally get to enter into the land and establish their home there. You see, the king of Moab didn't know this. He was fighting against something that he could not see. It was a vision of hope, a vision of security, of permanence, a place to call home for what had been a wandering and nomadic people. Now, while the king couldn't see or hear, the prophet Balaam could because God gave him a vision. You see, Balaam saw in this valley below a throng of people, a people so numerous, it just seemed like that they filled the whole valley beneath him when he was perched on top of a mountain. As far as as I could see was a throng of people. And it was in that lofty place that God gave Balaam the ability, a spiritual ability to see, to see even more than what he could see with his physical eyes. Here's what he saw. It's recorded in Numbers chapter 24. It says, The Spirit of God came upon him, and he spoke this prophecy concerning them. Balaam, the son of Beor, says, The man, he's speaking of himself, the man whose eyes are open, says, I've listened to the Word of God. I've seen what God Almighty showed me. Friends, this was so powerful. He says, I fell. And my eyes were opened. And then this is what he saw. He said, oh, the joys awaiting Israel. Joys in the homes of Jacob. I I see them spread before me in lush green valleys, fruitful gardens by the riverside, aloes planted by the Lord himself, cedar trees growing beside the waters. They're going to be blessed with an abundance of life-giving water. Now, if you're a nomadic desert people, hello, that's a blessing, isn't it? Water is life. They will live in many places. Their king will be great. Their kingdom exalted. You see, friends, this people had been held together. They had been driven by a vision, a vision that had been passed down from one generation to another, the vision that they would inhabit this promised land. They remembered that God had powerfully delivered them from slavery in Egypt God disciplined them and taught them in their desert wanderings, and he would be with them as they entered this land. Now, I want you to notice what Balaam said at the beginning of this prophecy. He said, my eyes were open. I've listened to the word of God. I've seen what God Almighty showed me. My eyes were opened. You see, as Balaam was in a posture of listening, of receptivity, of seeking God, he saw. God somehow placed within his mind a vision, a a picture, an image, an image and a vision of what the land would be like when the people settled there. He saw joy on their faces. He saw abundance and prosperity. He saw lush crops, flourishing forests and herds. I want to pause. We'll come back to that. Because as we begin this new year, we are beginning this series, Reset. Fresh start for a new year. You know, friends, this is a good time for us to reset our vision, our values, our our purpose, and the pathway that we will take to get there. And friends, it's important because we want to make sure that we are in alignment with what we are desiring and seeking and then what God has for us. We want those to be in alignment. Amen? In the series, I believe it will not only speak to us individually, but my hope is it will also speak to us corporately as the family of faith here at St. Mark's as we seek to live out that mission and be faithful to what God's called us to. 
Today, in week one, we want to talk about this idea of vision. It's clear that God gives vision. It was a clear vision that inspired and guided God's people, that we just heard their story. Even, as you know, as you read deeper into the story, they failed God, they turned from God, but this journey brought them back to this place. It kept them united, and it kept them loyal to God. Vision is a term that gets used a lot, isn't it? When you hear about it in the church, you tend to think of this unique spiritual experience like the prophets had. They, they had this spiritual experience where they could see something beyond what their human eyes could see. But vision also gets talked a lot about in the business world, doesn't it? Because vision encapsulates those shared goals. It's a, a picture of that future, that desired outcome where we are striving to get to. One business author defines vision this way. He says, vision is a picture of a preferred future. And then he says, the work of a leader is to communicate this picture of a preferred future in a way that's both compelling and unifying. Now, as we reset today, I want us to merge that spiritual understanding of vision and then this corporate understanding into a powerful concept that will inspire us to keep making progress, to keep pressing forward to the goals. And here's the key that God has placed in our hearts. This isn't something that we're just dreaming up on our own, but as people of faith, we're seeking God. We're saying, God, what is your vision for me? And what is your vision for this church? The second part of vision that's very important, not only does it give us that destination. So for the people of God in the Old Testament, they had a geographic destination that was their vision, right? What if for us, though, it's more symbolic? But it is a clear picture of this destination of where God wants us to be. But not only that, friends, vision gives us fuel to get to the destination, some of you are old enough in here to remember this fella, Popeye the sailor man, right? Popeye, when he saw his love, Olive, when he saw her in distress, what did he do? He got his spinach, he summoned his inner strength, and then he would proclaim, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. Popeye had had enough. And it moved him to action. You see, here's the thing. The vision that God places in your heart will also be accompanied by this compelling drive, this energy, maybe even sometimes an irritation, because you're going to see that something is wrong. Something's broken. Something needs fixing, as we say. You see an issue and something that could be done in a better way. It's this discontent within us, the way things are presently, that fuels our vision that things can be better. And not only can they be better, they must be better. So this vision fuels us to want to solve a problem, to meet a need, to arrive at that preferable destination in the future. And here's the reality, friends. You probably have discovered this. But until we are discontent with our present situation and our circumstances, we're never going to pursue the vision of change that God has for us. Amen? Until you get fed up like Popeye and you just can't stand it anymore, you're not going to be moved to action. So that's where we need to be today, friends. You see, vision forms that picture within us. We see this preferred future. It fuels our desire to bring that vision into reality. Now, through the series, I want to share with you a case study, a real-world example of a vision coming into reality in a remarkable way. In preparation for the series, I've been reading a book. It's written by Cindy Monroe. Cindy's husband and her partner in the business. I think we have a graphic of that because I want you to, to see this book. 
Cindy's partner and husband is one of my best friends growing up, Scott. We were band geeks together in middle school. We were uh, brought to faith in the Lord in the same youth group together. I consider Scott to be like the brother that I never had. Yes, I'm an only child, and I can only surmise that when mom and dad had me, they thought, well, we can't do any better than that, so let's just stop now. (laughs) If you want to hear the real story, you can talk to them. In Cindy's book, More Than a Bag, it celebrates the story of a direct sales company that literally she started in the basement of her home. And from those humble beginnings in their basement, this company grew to be one of the largest direct sales enterprises in the nation with more than five billion, that's with a B, $5 billion in sales. It's been fascinating to watch how God has used my friend's vision to not only generate a lot of sales, that was really just the mechanism to achieve the vision, but to really to see, and you'll read about it in their story, how many lives were impacted through their business. Now, guys, if you're like me, you've probably never even heard of 31 Gifts, but I would imagine that several of the ladies in here have. In fact, maybe you even have one of their bags or totes. I'm not really into bags, not really a bag kind of guy, but there's obviously a demand if you can sell $5 billion worth of bags. Here's what Cindy said, though, about selling bags. She said, some people think we empower women to sell bags. But the truth is, we sell bags to empower women. I founded 31 Gifts in 2003 with one simple goal in mind. That is to help women by giving them the opportunity to run their own successful business. And did you catch that, friends? Cindy was driven by a vision. Not a vision to make a lot of money. Not to sell bags and home goods, but to empower women. And the way that she did that was creating opportunities for them to experience success and achieve their own dreams and goals. That's a huge difference, isn't it, friends? So throughout the series, I want to refer to Cindy's book as a case study for how we can reset our vision, our values, our priorities, so that we are, again, in alignment with what God wants for us. Each one of us has a unique design and calling to live out, to pursue. I would encourage you to get a copy of the book. I think you'll really be blessed. In fact, just this week, they'll be releasing an audio version. So if that's your preferred method, you can enjoy it that way. But I think you'll be amazed as you read their story about the number of lives that have been impacted Imagine having a dream and vision, and maybe you're afraid to even share it. You, you work up the courage to share it with your husband, and he's supportive. So you begin to have those little coffee table conversations. Maybe you have conversations at Starbucks, and you, you just share your heart and your dream with people. And you begin to build a team of people that are willing to work together and to sacrifice and to work hard to achieve the vision, this preferable future. It's an exciting and inspiring story, friends, and we want to use that as a part of our journey. As we wrap up today, let's go back and finish up Balaam's story. You see, I intentionally left you hanging because, sadly, Balaam's story didn't end well. We see from the Apostle Peter that he uses Balaam as a warning for us, for those who want to remain faithful to Jesus to the end. In 2 Peter 2.15, we hear this, they, Peter is, is speaking of false prophets and those that are leading others down the wrong path. He said, they've left the main road and they're directionless. Having taken the way of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophet who turned profiteer, a connoisseur of evil. Wow. So he started on the right path. You heard his heart that that he didn't want to say the message to the king until he sought God first. And whatever message God gave him, whether the king liked it or not, at that point, Balaam 
wanted to be truthful. But it looks like that in the end, according to Scripture, Balaam is remembered who was one who was unable to ultimately resist that pull, those other visions. Visions that would lead him away from faithfulness to God. Peter says Balaam was directionless. His heart turned away. Friends, as we begin this new year, I think it's, it's imperative that we ask some important and probing questions of ourselves. One is, whose vision are you following? What vision are you giving your lives over to? Is it God's vision for your life? Is it that compelling and preferable picture of the future that compels you to act and then to order your lives in ways that you are actively pursuing the vision that God's placed within you? Whose vision for your life are you following? And then the second question is, what's fueling your vision? What issue, what evil or injustice, what wrong are you compelled to fix? What problem do you want to solve? What need do you feel compelled to meet? What's fueling your vision? We just celebrated a tremendous example of a vision coming into reality, and we got to be a part of that. Rhonda Paulson's story, her vision to provide this loving, warm, safe environment for children, the Isaiah 117 house. That just started in the mind of a soccer mom. And now look at it. There are dozens of these homes in multiple states, and we are a part of seeing her vision come into reality. Isn't that amazing? Whose vision are you following, and what's fueling your vision? So friends, as we begin this new year, we want to give ourselves a new and and fresh over to God, to be open to God to speak to us, and to place His vision in our hearts, and to have His Spirit be the fuel that motivates us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these examples that we can see, not only in Scripture, but in our current day. Examples of where people have had this image in their mind, this vision that they believe is from you. And then they've had the fuel of courage and conviction and faith to step out and to to make progress to seeing those images in their mind become reality. God, I pray that we as the people of St. Mark's, as followers of Jesus, I pray that each and every one of us would be people of vision. That we would see some need that we just can't stand idly by anymore, but we're compelled by your Spirit, compelled by a vision to make a difference. God, help us to have your vision, to be like Balaam in his good times when he would seek you, when he would hear the word of the Lord where he could see. God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. This is our prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, As we continue to worship, let us use this closing song to seek God and to listen for what God may be trying to say to us about the vision that God would like us to be a part of. Let us stand and worship together. I look to you and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, cause you know just what to do. I look to 
like you do God, I look to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom Cause you know just what to do And I will love you as we prepare to leave today, let me just remind you that there's always so much more that we can't cover in our time together. And so that's why I create a daily steps devotion to help you process what God has uh, done in your heart today. We, we continue that through the week. And so I invite you to be a part of that. You can download it Monday around noonish on our website or on our Facebook page. I'm going to be in the back. I've got a handout that talks about the disciple uh, group that we're going to form. Uh, it's for a period of about three months, so this isn't a forever thing. Uh, but it would be a, a pretty intense season of spiritual growth and development that I want to invite you into. Amen? Amen. Let us proclaim our benediction together. The light of God surrounds you. The love of God enfolds you. The power of God protect you. The presence of God watch over you. Wherever you are, God is. If you feel comfortable holding the hand of someone close to you, please do so as we sing our sending chorus.
to take a point set of home, please do. We have some back there and here. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great week. See you next week. <laughs>